very much, Chris. And thank you to all the Robots Conf team for getting us all set up and having this. How about that, guys? How about give them a round of applause? All right. So I am here to talk to you about becoming a maker, or as I kept calling it when I was writing it, you know you're a maker when. Because I fully intend not to be terribly serious, because that's not a lot of fun. But I have a list of things and a ton of stories that have happened to me as I've started to go from completely a software developer with no clue what I was doing with hardware to still having no clue about hardware, but blowing up a few things. Sweet. All right. So I kind of have to do the required bio slides before I talk about anything interesting. Um, I try not to let it define me too much, but for the last four and a half years, I have been a computer engineer with NASA at Kennedy Space Center. Um, three of those, my time has been 100% devoted to the spaceport command and control system, which, skipping the long and technical definition, is computer support and hardware support for everything on the ground. So everything from the vehicle assembly building to the launch control center to the pad right up until T0, that's our software and hardware. I've been completely on the software team. Um, a year and a half ago, I switched to doing partial time with our Swampworks lab, which is a rapid prototyping research and development lab. It's fail fast, fail early, and then move on. But ideas aren't discouraged. If you want to try something, you go for it, you fail, and you learn from it. <clears throat> My time with them increased a little bit uh, about a year ago, but I'm going to talk about that later. And now, because I talked to our legal folks about presenting, I just have to give the disclaimer that of course, everything I'm telling you is my own stuff and not the opinions of NASA and all that kind of thing. Um, otherwise, they get kind of angry with me for not running it by them. So the other side of me that's not work, um, I'm a type A+, plus because A is just not enough. Um, I, I'm a professionally trained musician. I'm a former EMT. I do half marathons. I'm a triathlete who's insane enough to try a half iron next year. Um, and I'm also extremely insane because I'm a board member at Orlando's Hackerspace Famalab. Um, all of that just kind of makes me a masochist more than anything. And through this, you're also going to see that I'm really, really bad with Photoshop, but at least you'll be entertained. Um, I'm really terrible at taking project pictures, too, because I'll get halfway through, remember that I should be documenting, say, whoops, take a picture and move on. So I do a whole bunch of stuff. How did I get to this point? I started with a fully software world, and I got started really early. My handwriting's still that bad, um, but it started worse. I started with my first DOS book, learning CD and being proud of that, working through the examples, digging through all the manuals that my parents had lying around the house, completely to the exclusion of hardware. Had not a bit of hardware at all. But it wasn't that I didn't want to, it was that it never occurred to me. I built my own computers as a kid, and I built my own computers as I was growing up, but I never cared about anything lower. Um, microcontrollers, uh, PICs, everything. I just didn't care. Or I should probably say I didn't know what I was missing. That's probably closer to the truth. I didn't realize that bars there. Oh, well. Um, to care about something, you have to know it's there. And I just didn't. So a lot of you come from a software world. Some of you maybe not. But I can see some of you looking to see what the code is up on the screen. And that's actually from a rocket project that I'm doing at my hackerspace. It's kind of on hold for the moment. But with experimental rocketry on the model scale. So we're making our own fuel, we're designing our own engines, we're writing our own software. Um, it's a lot of fun. It costs quite a bit. So we're kind of taking a pause. Um, but all of you came to RobotsConf to either start or continue down the path of becoming a maker. See how I uh, kind of put the title in there? But what, do we know what being a maker actually means? It's a little more complex than you would think. So if you look at a whole bunch of dictionaries, they're terribly helpful, and they say that a maker is someone who makes. Um, that could be my cat or a small child, because they both make messes. But in seriousness, let's look a little deeper. What does it actually mean to be a maker? I've spent actually hours trying to figure out a good definition, because I can overthink anything to death. So, in my head, a large part of the definition is someone who works with hardware. Well, that's great, but I know a ton of people who do art that I would consider makers. We have a guy at our hackerspace who made a spray paint bot that makes art on large sheets of wood and thankfully not the wall. Um, all right, well, we need to include artists in that. So maybe it's someone who creates physical representations of their ideas. But what about all of us software people? I would consider us makers. I would consider a large number of us makers. So being a maker has a ton of characteristics. 
There's do-it-yourself culture, there's constructivist learning, uh, there's community learning, there's a heavy STEM focus, engineering technology. Um, STEAM's becoming a bigger thing, including the arts with STEM. A lot of innovation, prototyping, and creativity. But the best definition that I can come up with is that it's a mindset. It's how you see the world around you and how you see your ideas and how you see other people. So the best way that I can define for you what I think a maker is to, is to show you a list of things that can and will happen as you become a maker. All, many of them have happened to me, many to my friends. I have collected a lot of good stories over time. So my first one, at least for me, is the most fundamental. It's a shift in your thinking. You have that aha moment if you haven't already. So up here, I have a couple of stills from a YouTube video of a guy who did a laser harp with open lays and open CV. Now, I had been hanging around in my Hackerspaces IRC channel, just kind of yapping about whatever, and somebody posted a link to this video. And I sat down, I watched this video, and thought it was the niftiest thing I'd ever seen. And I get on the channel, and I'm like, I want one of those. And then a second later, I said, I want to make one of those. And that was the moment when I realized that I was a maker, or at least I was becoming a maker. It was the drive to want to make something instead of acquire it, or hack it apart with other things. But it was a shift in how I was thinking about the things around me. And now part of this was also the reaction of the people around me, the people in channel with me. Instead of criticizing, I started to describe what I wanted to do, because I wanted to take this further. I wanted to make a lap harp out of it, about this big, so you can actually sit, have a frame, and then as the idea grew and grew and grew, I wanted to have um, tactile strings, maybe fiber, to play the laser down so that you could see what you were hitting, you would actually have something to hit on that laser. And as I kept going, kept going, people were contributing to the discussion and not dismissing or being critical, and they were getting all excited, some of them. One guy was almost as excited about the idea as I was because I had had that moment. To him, it was entirely what this whole thing is about. So, continuing along, your shift in thinking also happens when you look at stuff. Your inner monologue starts to do a lot of, I wonder what, or your outer monologue too, if that's your thing. I wonder what, I wonder what happens if I do this. I wonder what happens if I take this apart. I wonder what makes this thing tick. You're gonna start to hang on to more and more random things if you're anything like me. Um, I bought a stuffed animal for a pet. It played the little tune or something. And I had to take the speaker out because I knew the pet was gonna eat it. Well, I took it out and I was looking at it and I'm like, well, I can pry it apart at the seams and see what's on the inside. And I did, and it was a simple little circuit, but I wanted to know. This picture is from our Power Wheels racing contest at Maker Faire Orlando. Um, we had taken apart several Power Wheels and several scooters, and we're trying to figure out the best parts to use for our racer. And this is actually a console from a scooter that I was trying to get the blinkers and the voltage and everything else to work on. We didn't end up using it. I just wanted to see what it did and how to make it do things. So while you're taking apart everything in sight, not everything is going to open up quickly. Things are going to pile up. For Reddit's Arbitrary Day Secret Santa Exchange, I got this stylophone, which is kind of nifty. It's a little electric keyboard. It's cute. You tap on the keys. It plays music. But I was way more interested in how it actually works. What, when the stylus touches it, what's going on? I'm going to take it apart one of these days. For now, it's kind of sitting in my pile of nifty projects. And then on the other side is just a Casio keyboard that's broken. You're also going to have to be aware of the, oh, it just needs an X. It just needs this board. It just needs this part. Because you're going to start stacking up those sort of things, too. So continuing along, your project list is going to grow astronomically. Arduinos can be added to everything you own. Everything you own. Everything needs LEDs, I promise you. And everything needs buttons. The more buttons, the better. All of your friends will need something fixed. I have soldered together so many speakers and headsets and fixed keyboards and, of course, installed software and computers for my friends. And a lot of my friends come from NASA. But, hey, you can solder. Hey, you do electronics. Would you fix my whatever? And then everything can be modified, everything you own. And that includes yourself. Not my thing. A handful of my friends have embedded NFC tags in their hands, in the meat of their thumb. A few of them have magnets in their fingertips. With the NFC chips, they can unlock their cars, their homes, they can start their motorcycles. They can badge into our lab just by touching their hand up against the sensor. 
they can go to the vending machine, swipe with their hand, and get any number of Arduino parts at our lab, or food or drink or whatever, and it just links to their Google wallets. So the urge to modify things does not stop with actual objects. It's, it continues onto yourself sometimes. Um, this is just one of our guys scanning his hand just to show what's in there. In the original version, I left the ID unblurred and realized that was probably a poor choice. So because of your growing project list, and a lot of you have seen this this weekend, you're gonna say, oops, a whole lot more. You're probably going to invent several new cuss words if you're anything like me, um, and you're going to find lots of new ways to let the magic smoke out. There are many, many ways to let magic smoke out, let me tell you. Now for anyone who doesn't get the reference, if you're, if you're brand new to hardware, it originally referred to the smoke produced by overheating electronics, but now we just kind of say, well, I let the magic smoke out of this, or I let the magic smoke out of that. It's just breaking another hardware part. You will turn your light emitting diodes into smoke emitting diodes. You're gonna pop capacitors, you're going to fry the chips in your Arduino, which I've done. Um, if you really wanna be entertained, YouTube popping capacitors or overvolting capacitors, um, some people have deliberately made very large caps and exploded them for my entertainment. Um, both, I have two pictures up here. One is one of my projects, the other is not, but it's electronic score, and who doesn't like electronic score? The one on the right is a popped capacitor. That's what happens when you overvolt them. And the one on the left is a sound chip, the cheap version of which I bought off of eBay. I had put it in, I had this entirely in this project. The project was ready to be finished, and it shorted. So buying cheap parts will also cause you to let out the magic smoke. I ended up buying from SparkFun in the present that this was part of, that I'll actually refer to later, um, was a few months late because I did this a couple of times. It can also happen if you fail to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, this laptop actually, which I'm glad survived, took 18 volts across a USB port because I was not paying attention to which circuit I plugged in. Um, thankfully it's well designed, shut itself off, but I, my heart stopped for just a couple seconds. Um, USB ports are designed to take, I think, five and a quarter maximum. You also haven't truly learned to solder until you've burned yourself, and you will burn yourself. I don't have a lot of good pictures of my projects, because usually when I'm panicking, I'm not really holding the camera. Oh, this is not smelling right. Oh, God, is that a fire? Not holding the camera. So thinking of fire, actually, you're going to spend a lot of time wondering if things are going to catch on fire or trying to incite them to. I have a friend from our hackerspace who wired up her wedding dress with fiber optics and LEDs. And as she got closer and closer to the wedding, she wasn't done. So she was just slapping in battery packs and getting everything all wired up. And when we had people plug her in, the plug was in the back and the small of her back, we had to be careful which plug we plugged her into because one was one amp and the other was two amp. And if she plugged it into two amp, then she might possibly catch on fire. Um, every time she sat down, we had to unplug her because the battery packs would burn her legs. This is oddly kind of normal for the people from my hackerspace. So with your growing project list, it's going to invade other parts of your life. Um, I had mentioned that I do triathlon and half marathons, and what I was working on actually almost all day yesterday and part of this morning was a workout indicator to nag me when I haven't done what I should be doing. So the app I use for tracking my training has an open API. You register your app, you can make rest calls. Well, I want to take NeoPixels and a Spark Core, put them in what's essentially an athletic tape container, kind of spray it so it's clouded like the jar I showed earlier, and have it be one color if I've been good and done my workouts, another color if I haven't worked out in a couple days, and then really get annoying if it's been a while. And you'll think about in your life where to put things with Arduinos and LEDs and buttons. This will happen in every part of your life. With your growing project list, your standards for recognition are gonna change a little bit, or at least get added to. Hackaday is one of the coolest things you can make, as long as you don't read the comments section. Um, people on the internet are very, very mean. I have several friends who made Hackaday. This is my one project that's made it. I made a little sieve of Eratosthenes for my sister, who was in school to be a math educator. And some of my friends thought it was nifty enough to send to Hackaday and say, hey, you should feature this, and it was featured and everyone I know emailed me and I was all excited. This was almost as good as getting awards at work. I was that excited. Some of my friends have made Wired and Gizmodo and raspberrypi.org and Adafruit and all sorts of things like that. These are new goals. If you make big enough projects or you make nifty enough projects or you work with other people on big things, you get recognition like this. 
all of your holiday and birthday presents are going to be handmade, or many of them are going to be handmade, and because of that, they're going to be late. Um, I tend to use my projects for learning. This one was, what can I make without buying anything else? It was a little hanging art piece for my little sister. Um, it's got a comic from, with Pusheen being siblings and all that kind of thing. She likes cats. And I just lit it with LEDs and I put it in a frame and I sent it to her, but I had to figure out how to wire everything up without blowing enough LEDs, which I blew a few of. But it was a challenge and it was fun and it was only slightly late. This project was terribly late. So I made, one of my friends is a NASA groupie and a huge NASA geek. So I made for him a stuffed rocket, about this big. Um, my sewing skills are far, far less than my electronic skills, which is saying something. Um, when you squeeze a little fin on the rocket, if it was upright, a little motor would shake in the bottom of it, LEDs would light up, and it would play a countdown and some audio from one of our launches. If it was upside down, it would play a clip from one of the Star Trek Next Gen episodes saying, can you make us go, we are broken. And it was nifty and it was fun, but it had a million little parts, and it had conductive thread, which I learned gets messy with hot glue. Um, I think this, I actually gave it to him in March, and it was a Christmas present, but it got there eventually. This was the one where I ended up blowing parts because I bought cheap parts on eBay. Always buy at least five, and you'll be fine. You'll get a little bit better at estimating your time, but not soon. This weekend, the project I had been working on for the workout indicator, I was like, I completely thought I was gonna get this done. I brought the little container with me, I brought my spark core with me. Oh, I can set the spark core up there, just write a couple of calls, I'll be fine. It was an entirely new API to me, it was entirely new hardware to me, this obviously didn't happen. So it takes a little bit of work. So you're going to have more LEDs and resistors and you know what to do with. I don't think I've ever actually bought a resistor, they just keep multiplying in my toolbox. You're gonna have a bajillion anti-static bags and you're going to have enough of those little plastic baggies that parts come in that people think are going to think that you're running a drug operation. They multiply. And I'm pretty sure I can build a fort out of the little red spark fun boxes. If you've never painted a wall in your life, even if you've never painted a wall in your life, you are going to love painter's tape and duct tape and gorilla tape and hot glue and all sorts of things like that. Why? Because it holds together everything. If it doesn't, it eventually will. I'm kind of partial to painter's tape. It's the same color as my Hackerspaces logo, but that'll come up. Um, I think I've gone through more hot glue than I ever did as a Girl Scout or an elementary school doing crafts. It's a very good insulator, by the way, especially for conductive thread. Um, I mentioned SparkFun. You will become an evangelist of SparkFun and Adafruit and your local surplus store almost instantly. I'm pretty sure I should have direct deposit of my paycheck to SparkFun. I don't know what I need that for, but it looks really cool. Unfortunately, it comes out of my mouth far too often. It's really bad if you have a shiny problem, and a lot of us tend to. If I had a quarter for every time I said you can get whatever on SparkFun, I could probably afford that shiny things problem. And I've actually also said, why can't we just get it at SparkFun at work? Hmm? Uh, SparkFun is um, an electronics seller hobbyist site. So they have all of the accelerometers, the Arduinos, the sensors. Um, everything on my Christmas wish list probably could come from SparkFun. Um, a lot of the stuff next door you can find on Spark, that we had today at the Makerspace, you can get on SparkFun. Um, we have a local reseller near my Hackerspace, which has, again, been kind of detrimental to my paycheck. So kind of along that line, you are going to be very excited by all kinds of new tools and shiny things. You will be eyeing up the tools at Home Depot and Lowe's going, I don't know what I need that for, but I wonder what I can make with it. Laser cutters and other new tools will excite you. On the side over there, I've got my friend hugging our new laser cutter that our hackerspace bought. It makes amazing things with acrylic and wood and etches metal, and I've spent far too much time playing with it, I think. But everything you own can also be laser engraved or laser cut, I promise that. And your YouTube recommendations, especially when you start getting into the bigger tools, are all going to become how-tos and product installations. So, you're gonna start small. This is my box from last year a friend gave me to put like a handful of LEDs and a couple of Arduinos in. And then you're gonna keep adding things. Um, on, the, on the far side, that is the box from Robots Conf last year with all the nifty swag in it, and I kept adding swag to it and I would find LEDs and resistors on the floor at our hacker space, and I would pick them up and shove them in the box, 
and suddenly I ran out of room. So you're going to end up buying something like a tackle box that has more LEDs than lures. I had have, I have this next door and ended up lending out my tools to quite a few of you um, yesterday. It's very convenient. It's also very heavy. But I figure I'm going to try to stay within this for a while and not upgrade to an entire house for all of my electronics. Although I have filled my car. The trunk of your car will get more and more full, and that is a soldering iron, and I have soldered out of the back of my car. It was convenient. So because I travel back and forth between the hacker space and my house, which is 75 minutes, and between work, I just keep my stuff with me, just in case. You never know when you might need your soldering iron. Because I tend to stay a little bit later at my space, I've got my overnight bag and my backpack with my laptop, and I'm pretty sure my gas mileage has dropped by half just from carrying around all of my electronics. So you might also join a hackerspace. I've ca I keep mentioning mine, a hackerspace and makerspace. I tend to use the two interchangeably. Not everybody does, but they're, they're mostly the same thing to me. A hackerspace, I think you, they did the survey, but loosely defined is just a community of makers and tear it aparters and tinkerers and inventors and people who do things. Now I found mine almost coincidentally. There was a, an Orlando game meetup group and they posted for a retro movie, a retro game night. So they had Sega Saturns and NESs and all sorts of things like that. So I went out and I'm like, okay, whatever. So we stayed through till about 11 o'clock and then I helped them clean up a little bit. And I was checking out their space, 4,000 square foot space, and they had something going on called Sunday Morning Code. It was a bunch of guys sitting in a room hacking through their coding problems and debating the merits of various programming languages. And one kid was a little vocal about his dislike of Java and I couldn't, my large ego could not help itself but step in and say, well, I use it at work. And he goes, oh, well, where do you work? NASA. <laughs> I joined the next member meeting because I had such fun at Sunday Morning Code. I think I left at 4 o'clock in the morning, which is actually what our hackerspace's name is from. It's not Family Lab or something cuddly like that. It's actually 4 a.m. Lab. Because the first time you come out, you will stay until 4 a.m. There's so much caffeine involved. So as a result of joining a hackerspace, you can say goodbye to any sleeping or an outside social life. Between LAN parties and hackathons and outreach events and classes and just going to the space to work on your projects, you can kiss your time goodbye. If you're absolutely insane, you can also end up on the board of your local hackerspace. Um, I'm the treasurer. Let me tell you how much time I devote to that. But it ends up being fun. It promotes the community. It helps the hackerspace. It helps us grow. So you might end up teaching classes and giving talks. Um, one of my favorite recent things, I was on a plane to go from Orlando home for Thanksgiving, and we were stuck on the tarmac for an hour waiting for the weather to clear. So I'm yapping with the people next to me, and we're doing the, oh, what do you do, what do you do? Oh, I write software. Oh, where do you write software? Kennedy Space Center. So that turned into a whole other talk, and finally turned into 3D printing, because I do 3D printing for the rapid prototyping group. And one by one, people around me were turning around and asking questions because they'd heard my seatmate going, oh, well, how does this work? And what about this? And can you print this? And by the time we lifted off, I had a mini lecture going on on the plane about 3D printing. And I exhausted my knowledge of 3D printing, which is about this big. This kind of thing happens. That's one of the best things about the maker community. It's one simple principle. I know stuff, you all know stuff, and together we know tons and tons of stuff. So let's teach and demonstrate and show and share everything we know because that just builds up our knowledge base more. And we can all appreciate it because we all have that maker mindset. I started by teaching myself soldering on a Saturday afternoon at my hackerspace completely by myself following instructions from YouTube. And now I teach or was teaching soldering at Maker Fair Orlando to thousands of people, and I mean that literally. I taught everyone from a three-year-old and you hold their hand, you don't let them have the iron all by themselves, to people who were too old for me to ask how old they were. And it's exciting and it's fun because you see the joy and you see the, them light up when they make that new thing, when they learn that new skill. They just made little blinky robot pins, but the number of people who were so proud at having learned how to do this was amazing. I've gone on to teaching Arduino, teaching classes after work off the clock, and teaching to interns who wanted to know how to make all the shiny things I kept talking about. And all of that, in part, led to the next thing, which was a change at work. When I was hired, I was hired as a computer engineer, which is kind of a catch-all term. I was hired to write software, and only software. But I joined Famalab, and I started down this electronics path. I kept telling my coworkers about it. 
oh, well, you should see what I did at the lab last night. I was at the lab so late. Look at this shiny thing I made. And then I got Matrix part-time. I got, I got lent out to Swampworks, which is much more a hardware shop. They needed a software developer, and they got me, which is good because they didn't really know what they wanted. I ended up getting some parts. They're so like, well, pick a computer and do something with this. Grabbed an Arduino from my trunk and kept going. I did a 3D additive construction, a 3D printing project. Completed it and went back to what I was doing. A little while later, got a direct request for my assistance. A little more hardware, working on asteroid sampling. I am still actually a little bit in progress on that project. We're a little bit on hold. But it was much more hardware involved. And it was all because I'd started yapping in my cubes with my coworkers about the projects I work on. And I'm not the only one. I know several people whose careers have changed, or who've changed careers entirely, thanks to picking up an Arduino, taking Arduino 101, learning to solder. My best friend went from doing AV stuff to being an exhibit designer at the Orlando Science Center. Because he knows Arduino, he knows how to use tools, he knows all those odds and ends and bits and things in the maker movement. Through work, I got industry certified to solder, which, is, which sounds really cool, especially when I tell you that I'm certified to solder on spaceflight components. It's incredibly cool, it makes people go, oh my god, that doesn't mean I'm soldering in space. I'm gonna get there, just not yet. We have soldered in space, though. I found that out trying to, do, trying to find pictures for these slides. So in my talk proposal, I used the words covert bathroom soldering. And I figure I should probably explain exactly what I meant. So I did a side job for a friend of mine. Um, they needed someone just to solder some extra parts for them. But they had a lot of strict rules on site. No dangerous activities without being authorized. So soldering, metalworking, welding, Anything involving anything where you could possibly injure yourself at all, you had to have authorization. So I wasn't certified for anything at that point, and I was being held up by a lack of leads on a part this big. I couldn't get alligator clips on it because it was just too tiny, and I'm, I was complaining in Google Hangouts to my friends from my hackerspace, and one guy half-jokingly said, well, that covers your building, right? And I'm like, well, yeah. Well, what about the other building? Because it was a multiple building campus. I'm like, all right, that's interesting. I'll just grab my iron from my car. I'll go next door and find somewhere to solder. It was a small little conference building, and every room was full, except for the bathroom. So finding no other unoccupied space, because I really didn't want to have to answer questions, and at the suggestion, again, of one of my hackerspace friends, I did the world's quickest and worst soldering job in the women's bathroom. Now, because it was a lab and a metal working space, it was mostly men. I was the only woman in the building at the time. So I sat there with my back, back to the door, plugged in high up on the wall, doing the world's quickest soldering job. Um, I ended up redoing it later, but it got me through the, the project I was working on. It got me further without holding me up. So you might get into repairing your own things as well. One of the silliest stories I have is from some morning. I had taken my shower, I was getting dressed, and I have a fan in my room, and it stopped. And it was just the power cord. Power cord came apart. It was a simple little side-by-side -side power and ground. It wasn't anything complex. And I got all excited because I can fix this now. I have a soldering iron. So I got out my iron, I soldered it back together, and then I realized I never finished getting dressed. So while some things change, like your skills and your abilities, natural absent-mindedness is still there. <clears throat> so you might get maker cravings. And this is, again, one of those really terrible Photoshop jobs that gets the point across. Cravings are the best way I can describe it. It's that feeling first thing in the morning, at least for me, when I get to work and I'm still trying to boot up, and I've got all these ideas flowing through my head from you know, the night before, or sitting on Google, or from the drive-in, and I really want to sit down and work on them and design them, and I'm at work, and I actually have real work to do. It also happens when I spend an entire plane ride reading Make Magazine, because my laptop is too huge to fit in the seats comfortably. I'll, I'll just read Make, and I'll get off the plane, and I'm all excited to try whatever I'd read about. It's really disappointing when you have other obligations and you can't spare the bandwidth to think about your idea. Especially when you get caught designing circuits and not listening to your chief systems architect in a meeting. I'm sure there are many, many more things that I could bring up that you'll do, that you might do, that your neighbor will do. This is just my list. So now you get the excitement of making your own list as you grow as a maker. So I want to thank you guys. I want to thank the RobotsConf team for being awesome and letting me speak. And I want to wish you luck on your path as a maker. <laughs>